everybody. Um, this is something like the ideal of what we would like to see. <laughs> this is the reality. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, what happens when the rug is pulled under the feet of your archaeological engagement project by the service provider no longer offering the service. At the time that Carol McDavid did her um, seminal research into the Levi Jordan Plantation website uh, publications in 1999 and 2004, she said that there were between 1,060,000 and 1,780,000 websites on the internet uh, that um, touched on archaeology in some way. Now, Colleen tells me, I'm not sure where that statistic is from, that uh, the, the figure today is closer to 60 million. Um, now, most of us, uh, uh, Carol McDavid um, suggested that websites perhaps weren't a great way to go about archaeological research. But most of us are here today because that's exactly what we're doing. We're um, viewing them as a major component of our outreach um, and engagement work. <coughs> and Julie Shablitsky and Nigel Hetherington have said that as a minimum, a project should have a website where visitors can find out information about what you're finding, who to contact, before going to any other kind of media. Now, when people were first putting websites uh, online, there was a fairly substantial barrier in that you needed knowledge of HTML, um, possibly other programming languages. But the increased focus on Web 2.0, content management systems, social media has taken away that barrier at least. And nowadays, we find ourselves inundated with requests to like projects on Facebook, to follow conference feeds, hashtag DigiPubArc, um, <laughs> and even to support projects on Kickstarter. With, faced with this barrage of, um, and these are just some projects that Colleen or I have been involved in, um, faced with this kind of volume of noise, it's quite hard to conceptualize how ephemeral, ephemeral archaeology's presence on the internet really is. But when the rug is pulled from under the feet, it's quite a shock. Um, so John Hawkes tweeted that about um, an atlas of embryonic brain cells uh, that he found was offline. And going back to the example of Carol McDavid's dissertation research, uh, the Levi Jordan plantation website, it's still there, but it hasn't been updated for a very long time. Uh, most of the biographical information is now out of date. Julian Richards, um, has found that a similar situation exists with digital, digital data, um, that you need to be actively curating this stuff to avoid obsolescence. Um, so that brings me to GeoCities. <coughs> now, in April 2009, Yahoo, who owned GeoCities at the time, um, still do, said that they were going to take the service offline. They weren't going to offer any more websites um, for free or, yeah, paid either. Um, at the time, it, was, it had been one of the most popular ways for people to put a presence online. Um, and so we're going to examine what happens when that's taken away. GeoCities was founded in 1994 as Beverly Hills Internet, or BHI. It was renamed GeoCities uh, in 1995. It offered free hosting. One of the big benefits is you didn't have to know HTML to put a site on there. Um, and I had a site. Uh, my first site was geocities.com forward slash sunset strip forward slash studio forward slash 2617, which really rolls off the tongue. And that's a reflection of this neighborhood's idea. Geocities was a mega community um, which laid itself out in sort of city block style um, along um, vaguely coherent themes. So uh, sunset strip was, I think, film, music, things like that. My website was about punk bands and yoga. Um, in practice, most of the websites that were hosted there were um, either self-contained or outward-facing, connected by links or web rings um, to sites away from GeoCities. Um, there wasn't really an intra-GeoCities community. And Madden and Fox in 2006, when they were writing a primer <coughs> about the concept of 2.0, contrasted GeoCities, which was then declining with its metaphor of place, with MySpace, which was then ascending, and its metaphor of person. I think we're probably still in metaphor of person. Um, 
So Geocities was acquired by Yahoo in 1999. Since then, it made losses. Um, it was still pretty popular, but um, in April 2009, they made the decision to take Geocities offline, and Geocities websites, except for the ones in Japan, went offline on October 27, 2009. So at the time of the announcement, I uh, took it upon myself to see what we might potentially be losing, because I thought at the time that we were losing it, although that's not quite the case, as we'll see later. Um, a Google search of the domain geocities.com in summer 2009 returned over 10,000 hits on the subject of archaeology. Now that number is vastly inflated, because that is um, hits on different pages that mention archaeology rather than different websites. So I trawled through these 10,000 res um, results until I got bored, um, <laughs> and catalogued 89 sites. Uh, I made notes about whether they were personal or institutional sites, um, broadly what kind of topics they were covering, whether they were still active. Now, I judged active to be updated since 1st of January 2008. Um, if any of you are aware of my blog at all, 18 months is a perfectly reasonable amount of time to leave a website and still call it active. <laughs> uh, so there was, there was quite a mix. Um, and we have here um, archaeologists and development in the top corner is an apparently long defunct campaigning group. If anyone knows anything at all about them, I'd be really interested in hearing that. Uh, we have zooarchaeology and taphonomy in the bottom is a, an academic kind of thing, um, an assistant professor in the US, uh, likewise Flint Mathers Anonymous. There were also <laughs> some fairly uh, contentious things, the Glasgow Network of Aligned Sites, the Archaeological Evidence for King Arthur, and a website on Afrocentricism and Black Athena. It was quite fun looking at all these. So, I've, having looked at 89 websites, I then attempted to find who ran them and if I could be in, get in contact with them. 58 of the websites had contact details on them, and I sent these people a survey, um, which asked rather a lot of questions um, about uh, who runs the site, what it's sort of hoping to achieve. Um, I'm just going to go quite quickly through this. Um, that first question on that slide is a bad question, and um, I won't touch on that. <laughs> this is a bit depressing. Um, I sent the survey to 58 sites, 18 emails returned undelivered, 9 people responded, uh, and one person very politely declined to respond. <laughs> All of the respondents were sole owners, um, or sole maintainers on behalf of the group. There were a few Archaeology Societies there, um, Oxford University's Archaeology Society and Birkbeck um, were both there. Six sites said they provide information or share knowledge, two provide contact details or membership communication for societies, and one was just a curated catalogue, I say just, it's a good thing to be, was a curated catalogue of web links. Four of the sites are based in the USA, two in the UK, one in Germany, one in Georgia. Three of the sites have not been updated since 1st of January 2008, Two contained primary data not available elsewhere, and two contained interpretations not available elsewhere. I should say, primary data, I included photographs in that category. Uh, six of the respondents said they would move their sites elsewhere. Seven were aware of published references to that website. So that's things in print that are now not going to work if you try to look for them. And six were aware of incoming links to their site. And I've gone ahead of myself slightly. Um, there was a free text portion and uh, where people could talk about their feelings about hosting a website on Geocities, about the Geocities closure, and more generally about how they felt about putting archaeology online. Um, rather embarrassingly, one of the respondents said to me that my email to them was the first they had heard about their email, their website being taken away. Um, not great communication by Yahoo. Uh, a number of people were very frustrated that they'd put time into putting a website and would have to find a new home for it. One of the archaeology societies, um, a local group in particular, had had their website hosted by their local authority. They had stopped doing that, so they recently built a new website on Geocities, only to have to move it again. Despite all that, 
they were all very, very upbeat about putting archaeology on the internet. Um, and they specifically felt that there should be active curation of archaeological websites and also curated personal websites for all archaeologists. Now, it turned out that we haven't quite lost everything. Um, the Wayback Machine was obviously in place in 2009, um, although interestingly, when I looked at it in October, putting this together, it wasn't there. Um, but it's come back since. GeoCities.ws <laughs> uh, and the UCities.org uh, particular efforts by groups of people to archive the content that was being lost through the GeoCities closure. And in the case of GeoCities.ws, you can actually sign up to host a website there. And I don't know how they verify it, but you can claim back your old website. So the question is, what? Can we learn through this? Sorting through the wreckage of the GeoCities closure is somewhat reminiscent of what we could call the other digital archaeology prime, which is um, the active curation of, of digital outputs, um, ranging from CAD files, photographs, um, and so like. And we encourage that confusion um, because digital archaeology, uh, that digital archaeology, is, is a thing that we can learn a lot from in terms of providing access to otherwise outdated um, data forms. And it should be informed by our discipline's uh, attention to materiality and our attention to standardized recording as well. Where was I? Uh, yes. So the risks of hosting data online, um, I've touched on this briefly before. Oh. Very briefly, the pl the plug can be pulled, and you might find you lose everything. Um, a lot of our websites are pretty much isolated nodes. Um, if it's about a single project or a single um, area of interest, then it might be might not be something that people are actively seeking out. So perhaps a better <coughs> thing to do would be to view your website as an organizing hub that pulls in data from elsewhere and content from elsewhere on the internet. So tweets, Flickr photos, things like that, links to things on Wikipedia, um, and f foster the connection um, between different uh, destinations on the internet rather than concentrating all of your efforts on one single point of failure. And on that subject, diversify. We all want to. A lot of us want to make our stamp on the internet um, and have our presence up there. But in truth, the better a better contribution to knowledge might be just to contribute to a Wikipedia article about what you know, um, or to engage with a community like Reddit where there is you can have an Ask the Expert session. Um, and I believe that is me. Thank you very much.